In today's episode. You are the account manager? Good. Now, they are yours to lose. Parking tickets in a war zone. Yes, sir, will do. Send it exactly like this. So let's get started. You are the account manager? Good. Now, they are yours to lose. I work as a manager for a reputed institution in the learning, development, and consulting field. The person who hired me, five years ago, had to quit soon after, within six months since, and hence I had a new boss. We also grew from a team of three to eight soon after. Now the person who hired me was a wonderful, patient, respectful man who had genuine interest in his role, his department, and the firm. The new boss on the other hand, who had held various posts within the organization before getting this role, is a straight-up self-obsessed, narcissistic, arrogant prick who is intolerable when he's having a good run and a straight-up jackass when things didn't go his way. I have been reporting to him for close to five years now, and I have grown a lot during that period I had completed my second master's, gained respect from all our clients, and I always go above and beyond when it comes to client delight. Fast forward to this Monday. We are back at work since last March, lockdowns, just that day. We were called on a meeting to discuss the past year and the way forward. We have had a rough year financially, and we had to achieve some ambitious targets. While giving the department head, no, my boss is only a middle manager and not the department head, a quick rundown on my key accounts, I had outlined a few conversations I had been having with few prospective new clients. He was impressed. Later after the meeting, my boss called me aside and gave a very crude speech about how I should focus more on my delivery areas and only pass on future business prospects to him since he's the account manager. He meant I shouldn't even be continuing to hold even preliminary conversations and inquiries with current clients for future prospects and potential clients. It was an embarrassing conversation for me because I have not been getting enough recognition and have been losing my interest in continuing with my current employer. And I was only going above and beyond my sales wouldn't be rewarded any way with any monetary compensation or bonus. This talk flooded me with memories of all of the times my boss had been treated me wrong. QMC I have since been calling off all prospective clients and passing off his contact as my boss, as the one to continue discussions with, and that I would not be part of the calls. Since I had developed a mutual respect and trust with all of my current and prospective clients, they were curious to know why I'd not be taking our discussions forward, a huge departure from the way they have known me as a client-facing manager and generally as a person. I have simply been telling them what my boss told me, I'm simply a manager and my boss is the account manager. I should focus more on my activities and one of them is passing on all business prospects to him. I also promptly told them that I'm not allowed to answer their queries even if they are preliminary. Now some of my clients have been with us for as long as I have been here. Some of the new prospects are from the network I have built through my current clients and their friends. Our biggest client, easily one-sixth of our yearly revenues, was shocked while they knew my reporting structure, they also knew I have been the foundation and pillar of our relationship. They have continually attributed the success of our work ties to me. They also have seen how my boss treats me. They promptly shot an email to my department head and the head of the institution that they are currently reviewing our ties on the back of the evolving macroeconomic situations. Two of the other prospective clients have already told me that they won't be working with people who disrespect their own and have pulled back respective, professional and respectful emails were returned as a reply to my email connecting them with my boss. So I'm off for the weekend with a renewed hate for my workplace. My boss is off for the weekend after losing our biggest client and close to one-third of the target financials, perspective, for the FI 2021-2022, note, we had an abysmal FI 2020-2021. My department head is off for the weekend after reviewing some of these emails with my boss. The institution head has called me in for a quick chat next week. Update, my boss just emailed me, copying my department head, who already knows about my Monday chat with the institution head, asking to set up a call between us, department head, boss and me, and my favorite client, who contributes about one-sixth of our revenues, at the same time as my chat with the institution head. I am not acknowledging slash responding to the email, because weekend. Update, I woke up to a reply email from the department head asking my boss to postpone the call with the client until Wednesday. 
Boss, further to our discussion, let's move the call with the client to Wednesday, blah blah blah. Update, my favorite client had paid upfront a huge amount towards a new engagement about a year or so ago. They had to make a payment for an ongoing engagement sometime this week, but today we have been asked to adjust that advance against the invoice due. My institution had asked me about how we came to this point we spoke in length, and I told him how and why I had to write those emails while I have been bringing in leads and clients, my name has never been on the accounts. Since my boss had not given me top rating in performance appraisals the past year, I took his instructions on focusing better only on my deliverables and leave all account management to him. What happened next was not in my control my boss had clear visibility on my contact with them even up to last Monday, and he had had no qualms about it till then. I pulled out my emails and told him that I had merely connected my boss formally as the next logical step in closing the deals. We are due for a formal meeting on Friday my head of department, my boss, the institution head and me. I may be given added responsibilities going forward. Fingers crossed. Update after the Friday meeting. 1. The head of my department brought the institution head up to speed on the recent developments. My boss clarified to the room what his instructions to me were. 2. When asked to speak, I presented them some email samples and clarified that I had indeed followed instructions. I also presented copies of my previous appraisal reports. 3. I asked for additional responsibilities with relevant compensation. My boss was not so fond of this request and the head of my department concurred with him. Thankfully, the institution head was willing to give me an opportunity. For, so my first task is to engage with my largest account and bring them back to the table whatever sales commission that my boss used to get from this account will be mine to earn. This has painted a huge target on my back since my reporting structure remains the same. 5. I'll train for the new role under my current boss himself, which sucks. All new leads that I bring in has to go through my boss henceforth again a point of contention because my additional responsibilities clearly include bringing new accounts, but I still would be reporting to my boss who is an account manager himself. Parking tickets in a war zone. Yes, sir, will do. I was in a prison camp in Iraq, and the MPs in charge wanted us to basically give parking tickets. But if you're willing to put in the effort, you can do it well. The no talent ass clowns running our base in the desert sucked so bad that they had the prison part of the prison camp taken away from them, but they were still in charge of the base itself, and they weren't going to let anyone forget it. They started doing spot vehicle inspections, deadlining trucks for things like having a bulb out, who uses turn signals on a combat patrol. At one point they decided to use QRF as meter maids. QRF is the quick reaction force. It was a shift that you might get once or twice a month that meant being ready to run out and back up a patrol or whatever. Effectively, it was a day or half day off. Gear up, load the trucks, and then just keep your radio nearby. Worker bees having downtime while getting credit for working didn't sit well with battalion, so when we had QRF at night we had to check every vehicle on post and turn in a list of all unsecured vehicles when we came off shift at 6 the next morning. In addition to giving QRF some stupid stuff to do, it would harass all the other units on post and use their own troops to do it. Army trucks get locked by running a cable through the steering wheel and padlocking it. They began this assignment by giving a red padlock to QRF so they could secure an unsecured truck and the driver would have to report to the sergeant major to get the key. That lasted a couple nights until one guy was so offended by the idea that he threw the padlock back at them. Me? I didn't have an insubordinate bone in my body, I complied enthusiastically, going above and beyond the call of duty. For my QRF shifts I got the teams loaded up, stashed my gear in the truck, and then prowled the base on foot with my clipboard. When I found an unsecured vehicle, I hunted down the guy who owned it. I'd find someone from the unit it was assigned to and ask who they thought it belonged to and work from there. Soon enough, the truck was either secured, or I could say in good faith, that it was on its way to being secured and leave it off my official list. My official list of unsecured vehicles, the one I turned in the next morning for the sergeant major to read, only had vehicles that were assigned to battalion HQ, and no one could say that I failed to report the others because they weren't unsecured when I was done with them. And now the background, if you care to read it. When the US invaded Iraq, my main reaction, after explain why this is needed, was detached interest. I was in the National Guard, but I was in a towed artillery unit. 
As any idiot knows, you don't need towed artillery in a mechanized war in the desert, or to occupy a country. So interesting, yes, but nothing to do with me. Well, those Pentagon guys who spend their careers planning for things whipped up a plan. The army had tons of artillery in the guard, and no need for them in Iraq. What they needed was tons of MPs to escort convoys and secure rear areas, if it's not frontline combat, it's the rear area, and artillery units happen to convoy themselves and keep themselves safe in rear areas. It's a simple round peg and round hole solution. So they came up with a neat way of fixing that problem, but there's always going to be a mess, isn't there? The idiots who started the war lived in an alternate reality that looks so innocent compared to what their successors have built. Because of their insistence that we would be greeted as liberators and that surely 125,000 troops would suffice, the Pentagon was forced to plan and conduct the actual invasion based on those fantasies. Months into the occupation, the administration finally had to recognize that a, we were going to have to occupy the place for quite some time and b, the troops who invaded in March couldn't simply stay in Iraq forever. So the Pentagon was finally allowed to whip up a plan to occupy a country with a growing insurgency and keep it staffed indefinitely. It was ugly, but it worked. The plan wasn't as simple as park your howitzers, put on MP armbands, and get on the plane, but it was close. One bit of the ugliness of the plan is that MPs do things other than rear area security, Codfish Joe's artillery unit, and a few others, went to a prison camp. One run by absolute idiots. They were so bad, Brigade kicked them out of the prison part, literally putting the artillery guys in charge of it and splitting up the real MPs, assigning a few of them to each of our platoons. Yes, Abu Ghraib actually looked at another prison camp and said you're doing it wrong. Send it exactly like this. As part of my job working in complaints I write letters to customers. We don't use templates and each letter is tailored to the individual. Sometimes customers raise multiple complaint points and each point is carefully addressed in the letter we send. We outline everything the customer is unhappy with, our full investigation, and what we are doing to put this right or alternatively explaining carefully why their complaint is not justified. A new manager Steve was hired a few months ago, and he decided that we were wasting too much time writing letters, and he was going to come up with a template for us to use as we were obviously too simple to understand how letters are meant to work. So he goes off and drafts a template and proudly shares it with us all. It was shit, to put it bluntly. It was full of typos and grammatical errors, but it also did not contain details of what the complaint was about or how we had resolved it. Of course this was pointed out to him in full why this was not appropriate and why it would lead to more complaints and it's basically terrible customer service. He lost his temper screamed and yelled until three separate people cried and two logged out of the virtual meeting. Afterwards he sent an email saying he wants his letter used exactly as he has attached it. Who am I to argue? I sent the letters exactly as he had written them copied and pasted to ensure nothing was changed exactly as he asked. Write down to his signature and contact details at the bottom of the letter. I told the rest of the team and they all are sending letters with Steve's details too. Within the first week he had 40 customers call him and email complaining about the letter we had sent. The week after 50 irate customers. Steve hasn't looked into the complaint so he doesn't know how to address any of the customers or understand their issues. So I get phone calls day in and day out this man is livid what was his complaint about. Each time I reply oh it should all be explained in the letter I sent. You know the one detailing all complaint points, my investigation and resolution in full. I would just check that. Bye. The whole department is now under investigation as customer satisfaction has tanked. Best bit is each and every dissatisfaction is scored against Steve. Every other member of staff has 100% satisfaction, as nothing is logged against us our name isn't on the letter. Steve is on 0%. It's a terrible shame. If you made it to the end of the video, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share, and we will see you in the next video.